And the message is now called, Are You Approved? If you're taking notes, that's the title. Are You Approved? And one thing that God spoke to me about is that um, approval is something that people crave in society. But the only person whose approval actually matters is God. We look for approval from people when we should be looking for approval from God. And God spoke to me and said, I need you to get the people to understand how to be properly approved by me. Amen. So 2 Timothy 2 verse 15 is the first thing we started with. And we'll read it again. Y'all don't have to read it loud. You know, you just read along. It says, work hard so you can present yourself to God and receive his approval. Be a good worker, one who does not need to be ashamed and who, who correctly explains the word of truth. Now, when I look at the word work in this passage, it says work hard. How many people know that if you don't work hard, then you won't get anywhere? Yeah. It's not about how much work you do, but it's about putting 110% effort into the work that you're doing. Yeah. See, I can do a lot of things, but if I'm not putting complete effort into things, it won't pan out right. Yes, Come on, somebody. So when you work hard at something, you're putting your all into it. And as I begin to dissect this passage down, uh, you know, in the King James Version, it says study to show yourself approved. And I'm going to come back to that in a second. But when you study for something, you have to apply yourself. Amen. So as I begin to dissect this down, God brought to me James chapter 2, verse 26, which says faith without works is dead. Now, when it comes to serving God, you have to have faith in what you're doing. Because if you don't believe in what you're doing, you're wasting your time. The Bible says that he who comes to God must believe that he is and he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And when you're seeking something, you can study something. Because mm -hmm. you're seeking knowledge. That's all studying is. You're seeking to obtain more knowledge. So you're studying a specific piece of information. So when Timothy got this letter from Paul, Paul told him to study, in the King James Version, to show himself approved. Are y'all with me, church? Yes. Now, God spoke to me and said, you have to put in some work in your walk. You might want to write that down. You have to put in some work in your walk. What many believers think is this myth of once saved, always saved. We wake up, say a prayer in the morning, and go about our day leaning to our own understanding. We barely can show God about anything. And we think that that's the way to go because I already accepted Jesus to my heart, so I'm good. That's not how it works. You have to put in some effort with your walk. One thing I noticed about relationships is that a successful relationship is one in both parties are still putting in the same effort they did before they got the person. See, if you put in effort to get the person, and then once you get the person, you don't put in any more effort, you'll lose the person. Oh, come on, church. The same thing with God. If I put in effort to get God's attention, and I put in effort when I first come to Christ, but then after I'm here, I become lazy and procrastinate when it comes to my walk, Jesus. I'll fall off. Oh, if you'll wait till it's amen. amen. See, what God showed me is that, you know, you have to work hard in order to maintain your salvation because the Bible says work with fear and trembling. Fear is not fear as in I'm shaking in my boots. Fear is in a reverence to our Father. When you really respect someone, they don't have to look over your shoulder to see if you're doing the right thing. Yeah. You do it even when they're not present. Yes, yes, absolutely. See, I was talking to a man of God yesterday and something he said resonated with my spirit so much that I felt led to share. He said that the real test is not when you're sitting in the church on Sunday. The real test is when you leave because that's when heaven's cameras are rolling. Yes. See, God is watching you when no one else is watching you. So I'd rather be pleasing to God than pleasing to people. Because if I'm pleasing to God, people that have the right spirit will also be pleased. Yes, oh, come right. on, somebody. Are you with me, church? Yes, yes, yes. Amen. So, now, context is everything. You might want to write that down. Context is everything. Remember when I said in the King James, it says something else. It says study to show yourself approved. So let's just click a different version on the Bible app and click to King James. 2 Timothy 2.15, King James reads it like this. It says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Somebody say study. 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 Now, 
again, what I said earlier, if you study something, you're applying yourself. Yes. When you study for a test, you have to read the information and then read it again. Yep, yep, yep. And then you might have to read it some more. Uh -huh. See, everybody's in different cognitive levels. But based on where you are determines how much you actually have to study. Yes, yes. See, I know smart people that don't really have to study much because they got photographic memory and they can read something maybe twice and have it down pat. But I know some other people who are smart but not as smart as the smart people can only read twice and they might have to study five times. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, yes. See, how much you study is going to determine how much of an understanding you grasp of the yes, word. So write this down. Unless you study the word, you will never grasp a full understanding of the word. See, unless you study the word, you will never grasp a full understanding of the word. Paul told Timothy, he says, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, when it comes to the word, some people know scriptures off the top of their head because they heard them. But the people who can quote scripture the best actually spend time in the word of God. See, I know word without having to look at this tablet because I study. But it's not just the preachers, y'all say it's not just the preacher. It's not just the preacher. It's for the believers. <laughs> See, if you're a believer in Christ, you have the same obligations I have when it comes to studying. Right, right. Because the Bible doesn't say pastors study to show yourself approved unto God. It says study. That means everybody. Right. When you study to show yourself approved unto God, you put forth some effort, some additional hours than your original time you have. Okay? See, most people do the basics, the bare minimum, to get by. But again, as I stated earlier, if you do the bare minimum, you're going to fall off. Because as you continue your journey, what you did at step one will not work at step five. You need to study at step five level once you get to step five. Because studying at level one level once you get to step five, you'll get overtaken. You might have been making A's at step one. But when you get to step five, you'll be flat out failing because you need to upgrade your study life. Remember last week I told y'all to upgrade your prayer life. This week I'm telling you to upgrade your study time. Oh, come on, saints. I'm going to help you. See, Psalm 1 verse 1 through 3 tells me that you have to study the light in the law of the Lord and meditate day and night. Well, when I think about it, it never told us a certain amount of time. It just said study day and night. So that's at your own discretion. But again, remember, some people can study more than others. And some people can study less than others. And the cognitive ability will pick up based on where you are. When it comes to the word of God, though, it won't hurt you to study a little bit more. It's nothing going to happen to you wrong if you study more. If you read the word of God more than two minutes a day, I promise you it's not going to hurt you. If you study 30 minutes compared to five you'll see your strengthening in your spirit man. If you study the word of God an hour compared to 30 minutes, you'll see your spirit man strengthening a little bit more than the 30 minute time. See, I'm trying to explain something to you. It's not about, you can break it up. You might study 30 minutes in the morning and 30 minutes at night, but 30 minutes in the morning and 30 minutes at night is better than two minutes in the morning and no minutes at night. Come on somebody. You gotta study to show yourself approved. Now in Psalm 1, 2 it says the light and meditate. When I look at these words, I learn something. When you like a specific subject, don't you excel in that subject? I know smart students who don't like history, so they might get a B. But they love English, so they get an A+. Plus. You have to delight in the Word of God. You have to meditate day and night. See, what I notice is that people want to read the Bible backwards and forwards, but they're not reading things that actually are applying to their everyday life, so they get bored and uninterested, and then they don't read at all. But the Bible has so many different things and different parts to it that there's so much to learn that will apply to you in specific seasons. Oh, come on, somebody. See, um, when I needed wisdom, I was in the book of Proverbs every day. And then when I needed to learn how to properly run a church, I was in 1 Timothy chapter 3. And then when I needed to learn how to have joy of the Lord and praise and worship, I was in song because David was always praising and worshiping. Oh, yeah. And then when I needed to learn about walking in the spirit and not after the flesh, I was in the book of Galatians. Oh, yeah. Ephesians helped me too. Yeah. And see, when I wanted to know about the end times, I was in the book of Revelations. Oh, 
And I was also in Matthew because Matthew, Jesus began to explain what was going to happen in the end times. See, you got to read what applies to you. Because if I go try to read something that doesn't apply to me yet, I'll be confused. I won't understand. And the Bible says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. You can read something and not get any understanding so the knowledge profits you nothing. The Bible says with all you're getting, get understanding. Am I helping somebody? See, you got to study to show yourself approved and learn how to read what applies to you and get in that and get that down packed. Once you get that down packed, then maybe you can move on to something else. I'm not saying only read one portion of the Bible. Don't misconstrue what Pastor's saying. What I'm saying is there will be specific passages that will minister to you specifically for a certain season in your life. Come on, somebody. Uh, reading about the genealogy of Abraham and David don't really help you when you're dealing with lust in everyday life. What does someone's lineage do to help you with lust spirits? Or if you're reading about David and Goliath, and you're trying to figure out, um, well, I'm going to read this part, 1 Samuel chapter 17. Yep, I'm going to get this down pat. And you're reading about David killing Goliath with the stone. That's good if you need to overcome some fear. That's good if you need to overcome some giants. But if you need to learn how to walk in the spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh, I suggest you go to Galatians chapter 5. Yeah. Oh, come on, saints. I'm trying to help somebody. So, when you delight in the word, you begin to study a little bit more passionately and you begin to take hold of what you're actually reading, okay? So the first thing you need to understand is you have to delight in the word and meditate on the word. Are you with me? Come on, somebody. Now, the second point I want to give you is, write this down, avoid the chit-chat. Y'all know what chit-chat is, right? Unnecessary talking, unnecessary conversations. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 16. We're back in the NLT. It's the same passage as Swiss versions. It says, avoid worthless, foolish talk that only leads to more godless behavior. Verse 17 says, this kind of talk spreads like cancer. That's the only part I want to read to. I want to emphasize on worthless, foolish talk. God spoke to me. And he said, this doesn't just apply to spiritual conversations. This applies to regular conversations, too. Somebody understand that an idle mind is the devil's workshop. So idle conversations are also the devil's workshop. And if you talk about nonsense, it's not going to benefit you. But it ain't going to just be no effect. It's going to degrade your spiritual sense. I'm going to help you. The reason why this is, is because when you begin to talk nonsense, at some point there's going to become a difference in opinion. And once a difference in opinion comes, most people aren't mature enough to handle differences maturely. See, especially when it comes to spiritual conversations, uh, one person believes that they should eat pork because the Bible says in the Old Testament not to eat it. And then... Somebody else believes that in the New Testament it says that all things are to be received with prayer and thanksgiving and sanctified by the word of God in prayer. So then those two people that have difference in opinion begin to clash. So I got a group of believers on this side that believes that all meat eaters are going to hell. And the other group believes that the vegetarians are going to hell because both of them are misinterpreting scripture. Yeah, right. Foolish talk. The reason why it's foolish is because none of that is going to help anybody with their everyday life. Whether you eat meat or whether you don't eat meat is not going to help or degrade you. Now, if your personal conviction is to not eat pork like me, because pork is not a good diet choice, then that's on you. But if someone else has faith to eat the pork by the word of God in prayer, let them eat that bacon. Yeah. <laughs> no, seriously. No, I'm trying to help you. Because chit-chat, it leads to more godless behavior. Okay? And verse 17 says, this kind of talk spreads like cancer. Now, the body of Christ is what? A what? A body. A body. And if cancer is in someone's body, what does it do? Spread. See, what I'm trying to help you understand is that chit-chat ends up in godless behavior. And um, see, when you get in godless behavior, what is godless without God? So any behavior that does not have God within it is 
godless. Well, so foolish talk leads to behavior that does not have God in it. And when God is not in something, that means the devil can be in it. On, and when the devil is in something, that means sin is present. I and when mean, sin is present, on, you are disconnected from the most. Oh, so God spoke to me. He said, conversations are either uplifting or they're tearing you down. And since death and life are in the power of tongue, pointless conversations still lead to death. What we got to understand is that without God, we are sinners. Yeah. Yes. You're not perfect by yourself. I tell people they get offended, it's okay. There's no such thing as good people Amen. without God. Amen. I know good people who still cheat on their wife. <laughs> I know good people who still will skim a little money off the top if they think you won't catch them. I know good people who still curse under their breath when someone upsets them. But when they come to church, they raise their hands and say, glory, hallelujah. Again, there's no such thing as good people without God. When Jesus was opposed by the people and they say, good teacher, he said, why are you calling me good? No one is good except God. Now, what I'm trying to understand is how regular people, Christians, can feel comfortable calling themselves good people when Jesus, who was God in the flesh, still did not acknowledge himself when he was in human form as good. Come on. Ready for the next point? Holiness is the goal. Write that down. Holiness is is to go. Somebody say holiness. holiness. You know, God is holy. So we should aspire to be more like him. Right? So that should be the goal. Correct? Now I'm going to break this down to you. Same verse in 2 Timothy 2. Let's read verse 19. Verse 19 says, but God's truth stands firm like a foundation stone with this inscription. The Lord knows those who are his and all who belong to the Lord must turn away from evil. Yes. Verse 21. If you keep yourself pure, you will be a special utensil for honorable use. Yes. Your life will be clean and you will be ready for the master to use you for every good work. Hallelujah. Verse 22. Run from anything that stimulates youthful lust. Instead, pursue righteous living, faithfulness, love, and peace. Enjoy the companionship of those who call on the Lord with pure hearts. Yes. Verse 19 says, all who belong to the Lord must turn away from evil. Psalm 37, 27 tells us like this. Turn from evil and do good, and you will live in the land forever. So God spoke to me and said, my people have to learn how to turn away from evil. And I thought, well, God, believers are a separate from evil. That's the whole reason we're believers. But then he began to elaborate. Somebody say elaborate. elaborate. I'm about to elaborate. She God spoke to me and said, in 21, it said, if you keep yourself pure. I want you to understand something. Paul was not writing to a sinner. He was writing to a leader in the body of Christ and said, if you keep yourself pure. Why would he tell a believer if you keep yourself pure? The reason why is because we are humans. And so because we are in human form, we are susceptible to sin. Right, right. This is not God's domain. This is the devil's territory. Yep. Our home is in heaven. Yes. Right. And God's going to bring heaven here on earth. Amen. New heaven, new earth. Amen. But until he gets here, this is Satan's domain. Yep. So I'm here to let you know, ladies and gentlemen, even in scripture it says, let him that think he stand take heed lest he fall. Yeah. What does that mean? Your version of righteousness is not God's version of righteousness. Ooh. Your version of holiness is not God's version of holiness. See, I can think I'm a good person all day, every day. But if God says I'm not, then I'm not. See, there's therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. But the key is those who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. What spirit? The Holy Spirit. Because there's a lot of spirits. But the Holy Spirit is the only spirit I want to acknowledge. Exactly. So when I tell you holiness is the goal, I'm telling you that, like verse 19, all who belong to the Lord must turn away from evil. What does Psalm 24 verse 3 through 4 say? Who may climb the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? Only those whose hands and hearts are pure, who do not worship idols, and never tell lies. Well, most people don't worship idols, but most people tell lies. If you've ever told a lie, raise your hand. Okay. So, let's just say we're not perfect. 
Let's just say we got to work on this every day. Let's just say it takes God to purify you from all sin and uncleanness. I'm here to let you know that if you was looking for me to tell you that you're perfect, you came to the wrong church. I'm here to tell you that we all need Jesus. We all need the Holy Spirit daily. We all need sanctification. We all need the blood to cleanse and purify us. Because the only way to get to the Father is through Jesus. And Jesus is pure. Yes, if Jesus is in you, then that means you also can be pure. So I'm not here to tell you it's impossible. I'm here to tell you to wake up and understand that in order for it to be possible, you have to acknowledge when it currently is not. So when I say holiness is the goal, I want you to understand something. Write this down. Purity is not perfection. Write this down. I'm going to elaborate. Purity is not perfection. It is recognizing that the only thing good inside me is Jesus Christ. Yes, yes, yes. yes. I'm going to say it again. Purity is not perfection. It's recognizing that the only thing good inside me is Jesus Christ. Yes, yes. See, verse 22 says, run from anything that stimulates you for lust. Now, when we say lust, the first thing people think about is a physical thing. But I'm here to let you know that there are spiritual lusts too. See, like, lusting after a certain person's anointing is still lust. Uh, lusting after a certain person's ministry is still lust. <laughs> let me break it down. Lusting after a certain person's relationship wishing it was yours is still lust. Oh, Brother Tyler, it's good now. It's good now. Uh, lusting after, uh, you know, certain person's financial situations is still lust. Oh, lusting after someone else's career is still lust. Lust isn't just physical. It's mental and spiritual and emotional as well. Amen. So the Bible says in verse 22, run from anything that stimulates youth for lust. When you're youthful, you're not mature. It doesn't have anything to do with age. Spiritually, you can be immature. And naturally, you can be 50 years old. Mm -hmm. But I'm here to let you know that until you mature here in your spirit, man, this don't really matter in the natural. So when you got to run, the Bible literally means that. Run. When you have a situation where you're lusting after someone's finances, don't look at it no more. Just say, God bless me and mine, and I'm going to be faithful over what you gave me. When you're lusting after someone else's car because it's better than yours, to say, you know what, God, thank you that I even have transportation to and from. See, it says, instead, pursue righteous living. Somebody say righteous. righteous. There's no other person righteous but God. So in order to obtain righteousness, you need God within you. Come on, church, I'm trying to get this thing. It says, pursue righteous living faithfulness, somebody say faithfulness, faithfulness. Love, love and peace when you have peace things don't upset you like they used to when you have peace that surpasses all understanding, it keeps your heart and mind in who? Christ Jesus see, see the saints gotta understand that it's not a lot of stuff that you have to do to be pure and holy before God. But purity won't come unless you put in some effort. See, what we allow the enemy to do is to trick us and say, I'm not perfect, so therefore God doesn't want me. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, when I look in scripture, there was no perfect people except maybe three. Jesus, Noah, and Eli. And now that I think of it, Eli, no, no. Noah got drunk after the ark. And drunkenness is a sin. He forgot Mary. Jesus. And Mary was pure. And that's the reason the Holy Spirit chose him. But when I look at scripture, it's not a lot of perfect people. So if you're looking at a perfect ratio, you're looking to be the 1%. And you're not going to be the 1%. Because <laughs> the, the world we're living in today, oh, it's a different world than it was back then. Yes, sin abounded back then. But they couldn't pick up the phone and look at no pornography. Sin is literally a second away. 
They had to send letters to get to people from a long distance. We can FaceTime someone and talk filthy. Jesus. Uh, if you thought that the devils um, weaken, they only increase with yes. the advancement yes. of technology. Yes. See, the reason why Satan is the prince of the power of the air is because he can control technological advancement. Okay. So so be mindful about all of this technology you engage in because when the end times come, that's the first thing they're gonna do is ping everybody who's on the technological server, the yes. technology server. You, you understand? Yeah. So iPhones are good right now, but you might want a little trap phone when it go down. <laughs> so verse 22. Run from anything that stimulates you for lust. Instead, pursue righteous living, faithfulness, love, and peace. Now watch this. Enjoy the companionship. Somebody say companionship. companionship. Of those who call on the Lord with pure hearts. How many people know that most people who are going through things in like self-esteem issues don't have companions? Jesus. And companionship is a beautiful thing if directed in the right direction. But if Satan gets a hold of it, oh my God, it'll tear you to pieces spiritually. Because many people are falling into sin because of the companionship they keep. The Bible says companionship of those who call on the Lord with pure heart. Somebody say pure. pure. So, Psalm says, how can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping according to to thy word. Whose word? God's word. And God is what? The word. So if God's word is the only way to stay pure, that lets me know that, let's go back to an earlier point, you must need to know it. And the only way to know something is if you study. Oh. I told you, I don't talk. The Holy Spirit brings it back full circle. So, you have to study in order to understand why it's important to be holy. And you have to know the bylaws on how to be holy in order to be holy. Yes. And Jesus said, be ye holy as I am holy. Yes, yes. Come on, yes. So, holiness is the goal. Yeah. You ready for the next point? Come on. Write this down. Again, that, 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 avoid the chit chat. <laughs> Whenever something is mentioned twice in scripture, that means it's important. Well, I would say it's important because everywhere I go, I see people offended in different ministries. And I try to understand why they offended so much here. And God showed me it's not because of the people over the pavilion. Sometimes it is. But many times it's because it's a lot of unnecessary chit-chat. See, companionship with people who chit-chat will produce not holiness. See, see, I can't, if you noticed, when I first started, some of you could reach me immediately on the phone. And nowadays, most of you have to go through someone. It's not because I'm being bougie. It's because I'm praying for God to help y'all understand not to have so much chit-chat. Because if I stay on the phone and talk for too long about nothing, and just really listen to us each other breathe, then the devil, which is, I don't mind, it's the devil's workshop, then he'll inhabit my conversation because God is not in the mix of that conversation. And then if the devil inhabits the conversation, then we can easily offend one another. The Bible says woe to them who the offenses come through because offenses are going to happen. Yep. But my God, woe to those who bring the offenses. See, so check this out. What's verse 23 say? Again, I say, don't get involved in foolish, ignorant arguments that only start what? Fights. <laughs> See, God spoke to me. Write this down. Most of the time, strife is caused because of pride. Y'all gonna get it tomorrow. Most of the time, strife is caused by pride. Well, Pastor, what do you mean? When someone thinks they have the right answer and you're speaking with them, if you disagree with what they are saying, they get upset. And that causes strife because they think they're right. And when you think you're right and are not willing to be humble and listen to another person's point of view, you have now learned to have a spirit of pride. Jesus. Satan was kicked out of heaven because of pride. pride. When people ask me what's one of the most deadly sins, I immediately say pride. pride. Because pride will cause you pitfall against people that genuinely care about you because you think your way is right and everybody else is against you. Yeah. Ready for the second thing? Uh, ignorance includes not knowing 
and pretending to know. <laughs> Ignorance includes not knowing and pretending to know. When you don't know something and you pretend to know, that can cause a fight. <laughs> because when the people find out that you don't know and you pretended to know, they're going to be upset. True or false? True. Because if I pretend to know the word and then I start spitting nonsense, I won't have no more church. Because <laughs> the people are going to be upset. I'm going to be upset. Come on now. <laughs> but you know, I never have to worry about that because verse 15, I study to show myself approved. God showed me. Verbal altercations are just as bad as physical altercations. Because I've heard somebody verbally assault other people and cause a bigger offense than a physical altercation. Mm -hmm. And you know what? When you offend somebody, you know what stops you from saying, I'm sorry? Pride. Yes, yes. Come on. I'm preaching. I'm a priest of Brother Jackson because he always. See, she, she, Matthew 18, 7 says, Woe to the world because of offenses, for offenses must come. But woe to that man by whom offenses come. That means that if you can't acknowledge that you're wrong, you will offend someone. And if you offend someone and they walk away offended and never return, guess what happens? Their blood spiritually is on your hands. So, if you have offended someone and you know it, you might want to pick up the phone after this service and say, I'm sorry for anything that I've done that offended you. Can you please forgive me? Because the Bible says that if you don't forgive men their trespasses, then my father won't forgive you your trespasses. And if you are the one causing the trespass, Jesus, Lord. come on. Verse 24. A servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but must be kind to everyone, be able to teach, and be patient with difficult people. Somebody say patient. Patient. <laughs> when I became a pastor, the first thing God increased was my patience. Yes. <laughs> because people are like the USA, characters welcome. Y'all okay. know that network USA, that's the, that's the slogan, characters welcome, my God. <laughs> I've encountered some characters. And I love everybody. But I've encountered some characters. Okay. Now let me explain something to you. So, this is the next point you should write down. Check the checklist. Somebody say, check the checklist. Check the checklist. You might want to write this down because this is going to be good. Okay? Check the checklist. The checklist is this. Number one, underneath the check the checklist, you might want to write this. Don't quarrel. Y'all know what quarreling is? What is that? Arguing. What is arguing? A verbal altercation. <laughs> it all comes back from a circle. Don't quarrel. Well, Pastor, they just don't understand me. That's okay. Because the Holy Spirit don't always understand you, but he makes an assessment on your behalf anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Number two. Be kind to everyone. Somebody say everyone. Everyone. Not just church folks. It's going to be some people at your job that will upset you. Yes. You still have to be kind. Yes. <laughs> it's going to be some people in your family that's going to set you. You still have to be kind. <laughs> your significant other will not always make you happy. Sometimes they will upset you. You have to be kind. <laughs> be kind to what? Everyone. Number three. Be able to to teach. Now, let me clarify. You can't teach nobody nothing if you ain't got taught yet. I just want to say, you cannot teach anybody anything if you don't know the material that you're teaching. So if you don't study to show yourself approved, that part don't apply to you yet. Come on, somebody. I, 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 I want you to understand that God did not entrust me with the pavilion until I learned how to be faithful over Bible study. Yes, 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 yes. I was ministering out of an apartment kitchen yeah. to people. Yeah. Even when only four people showed up and I was faithful over that. And then God said, okay, now you can do Sunday service. And you want to know something else? I have someone I answer to, not just God. I have a spiritual father that's a human that I can pick up the phone and call when I'm out of pocket. So, if you're not able to be 
teach a bow, you'll never be able to teach. Yes. So, next part. Be patient with difficult people. Yes. That's one of my favorite parts because um, people can be very difficult. See, I can tell when somebody really don't like me and they faking, and I don't fake with them. I gotta still genuinely love them because God's in me. So even if the devil in you, I gotta let God in me shine forth. Yeah. See, if you let the devil influence you while someone is else being deep influenced by the devil, two devils start clashing. What's that cause? A fight. Mm -hmm. Y'all are saying you have to learn how to be patient with difficult people. Yes, 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 absolutely. But let me give you another little gem that's off script. God spoke to me and told me that being patient with someone does not mean you have to be in their face 24-7. No. Sometimes you can be willing to walk away so you can better yourself. Be patient. Be patient. Come on. What does that mean? I'm patient enough to love you from a distance and wait for you to get there, but while you're getting there, I'm going to go ahead and do what God told me to do. Amen. Do you understand? Amen. So let's check the checklist. Don't quote. Be kind to everyone. Be able to teach and be patient with the difficult people. Jesus. Now, you might ask, how will I know if people, other people are following this checklist? Matthew 7, 7, 7 16 tells us, you'll identify them by their fruit. What is that? What they produce. What is that? What they do. What they say. How they move. Okay. Closing points. 2 Timothy 2 verse 25. It says, gently instruct those who oppose the truth. Somebody say gently. gently. Now when somebody opposes the truth and you know it's the truth and they're still opposing the truth, does that make you want to handle them gently or ferociously? Man. Right, well, thank God for, 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 for honesty in the church. But you still have to be gentle. You got to check off your checklist even if they checklist ain't checked off. So, gently instruct those who oppose the truth. Perhaps, it says, God will change those people's hearts and they will learn the truth. But only if you handle them gently. Verse 26. Then they will come to their senses and escape from the devil's trap. For they have been held captive by him to do whatever he wants. So I'm going to give you two closing points. When you present the truth, it's not your job to make people accept the truth. No, not at all. Again, when you present the truth, it's not your job to make people accept the truth. Yes, Pastor. Y'all with me, saints? Yes. Yeah. Why? Because it says perhaps God, not First Lady, not Pastor, not Sister K. It says perhaps God will change those people's hearts and they will learn the truth. I want you to understand that Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all oh, men unto me. So you trying to do it by yourself will never work. No more. I can do all things through Christ, not through yourself. Okay. <laughs> See, scripture always comes back around somewhere else. You would know that if you study. Verse 26. <laughs> then they will come to their senses. Somebody say, come to their senses. Come to their senses. And escape from the devil's trap. For they have been held captive by him to do whatever he wants. Mm -hmm. So write this last point down. Somebody say, freedom. Is the key. It's the key. I told you holiness is the goal, but freedom is the key. The only way to know if you're approved is to study, avoid the chit chat, understand that holiness is the goal, avoid the chit chat again, and freedom. Once they become free, freedom is the key. Check your checklist. When you leave this building, Remember what I said, God is telling me to tell you again. If you wronged someone and you did anything that was not pleasing to him, repent before God first Amen. and then go make it right with that person. Because if we only apologize to God and not to our fellow man, we don't get the forgiveness. Amen. One day I did that. And you know what God told me? He said, but I'm not the one you wronged. <laughs> so you're asking me for forgiveness. And yes, I'm the one who can forgive you. But you wronged your fellow man. So you need to make it right. right. See, God speaks to me like that. Mm -hmm. 
I don't know how he speaks to y'all. Maybe he only speaks to y'all through me. But if he does speak to you, then you can hear him clearly. Sometimes he speaks through television. Sometimes he speaks through signs on our phone. Sometimes he speaks through signs out on the highway. Sometimes he speaks through another person. And then sometimes you just hear that distinct voice so still. I prefer all of it. Because sometimes I might miss it this way, but I catch it that way. Somebody say, check the checklist. Check the checklist.